Have you ever thought about getting your MBA? Well, the University of Louisville offers the only MBA with a distilled spirits focus. Graduate in under two years with both your master's and a certificate in the distilled spirits business at no extra time or cost. This unbeatable combination will prepare you to achieve greater success through deepened understanding on the business side of the industry, like finance, marketing, and operations. Again, this is 100% online, and all that's required is a bachelor's degree. Go to uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. There is a new award-winning four-grain bourbon that's been taking the market by storm. It's Penelope Bourbon. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced yet flavorful taste profile comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. It's currently available in two expressions, 80 proof and cash strength. It fits your mood whether you're sipping neat or in a cocktail. Penelope is available in select markets as well as online at penelopebourbon.com. Are you looking for an app to track your tasting notes and bottles, but also connect with other bourbon drinkers? The Oak Bottle Tasting app uses powerful analytics to suggest new spirits for you based on your reviews and the tasting notes that you enjoy. Explore the feed to like and comment on the tastings of your friends, distilleries, and verified tasters. With over 250 different tasting notes, recording your own tastings has never been easier or more accurate. Join the fastest growing community of tasters today. Search for Oak Bottle app on the Apple App Store. When I introduce people to it, I'll be like, they'll be like, what's it taste like? I'm like, if you could mix like soy sauce together, like it's like, it's like, like that. cake and soy <laughs> sauce. And like, like that, you know, it's got the texture of motor oil. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, you love this? I'm like, you're going to love it. <laughs> This is episode 279 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start today's podcast talking about barrel-aged beers, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Kroger is hosting the ultimate bourbon auction to end hunger, benefiting the Dare to Care food bank. Some of the rarest bottles will be up for auction, such as entire verticals of Pappy Van Winkle and the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection, as well as other rarities such as Michter's 25 year. The all virtual auction will be open for everyone and it started back on November 9th and will be running through November 18th of 2020, ending at 9 p.m. Eastern. And it's free for everybody to participate as well as you are donating to a 501c3. You can visit one.bidpal.net slash zero slash welcome or you can just use the link in our show notes to see all the items up for auction and start placing your bids. In June of 2018, in response to the U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum, the European Union imposed a 25% tariff on bourbon, which has now resulted in a 41% decline in American whiskey exports to the European Union. Now the European Union is imposing a tariff of 25% on U.S. rum, brandy, vodka, and vermouth, which will increase the tensions around the Airbus and the Boeing disputes and further damage the once-booming transatlantic drinks trade. Now... Let's go ahead and move on to some bourbon release news. Barrel Bourbon is releasing a new project in December called the Barrel Private Release Bourbon Series. It's a micro-blending theme where a variety of bourbons were spread across four different ages and blended into 48 different recipes, each going into an X bourbon cask. Now, the Private Release Bourbon Project was designed for exclusive store and group barrel picks. So if you're interested, contact your local distributor to set it up because only 48 are going to be made available. Woodford Reserve has announced the release of its annual holiday bottle, which this year features the festive artwork by renowned UK-based architect Nick Hurst. The serene painting called Winter Slumber captures the contrast between the warm wooden interior of the historic warehouse at Woodford Reserve and the stone exterior of the building. The one liter bottles are gonna be on sale across the United States and the globe for a retail price of $49.99. Grain and Barrel Spirits has introduced Chicken Cock Master Distillers Pick, which is a 15-year-old, limited-edition Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey released at Barrel Proof. It's featuring a mash bill of 78.5% corn, 13% raw, and 8.5% malted barley, and this expression was non-show filtered, and each barrel was hand-picked by Master Distiller Greg Snyder. Now, as I mentioned, it is non-show filtered, it's bottled at 114 proof, and only 1,350 bottles will be available 
throughout Kentucky and will also be available online at chickencockwhiskey.com with a suggested retail price of $300. Now, while the rest of the United States is out camping or waiting to bust down doors for Black Friday deals for toys or electronics, there's another set of crazies out there, and they're hitting up every liquor store to try to grab bottles from one of the most iconic barrel-aged stouts on the market coming from Goose Island. Now, every year, Bourbon County Stout has beer lovers drooling to see what variants will be released. And while this episode was recorded before the 2020 lineup was announced, this year you will see beers that have been aged in barrels such as Old Forester Birthday Bourbon, Weller 12, and other familiar barrels. And to get an inside look into personally one of my favorite beers of all time, we're joined by Bill Savage, who's a lead brewer for the barrel aging program at Goose Island. We talk about the time that is spent going into this yearly, yearly release and what happens when yeast goes wild. So what are you in the mood for? Bourbon, rye, rum, maybe a special finished whiskey. You can get all of these from Barrel Bourbon and you can order online now at BarrelBourbon.com. Enjoy today's episode and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick and this is Above the Char. I often ask for your help with ideas. Today I reached out on Twitter before I started recording and with a great, great suggestion was Forrest M at MC Trees 2 on Twitter. He suggested for my Above the Char, I talk about the virtues of toasted bourbons for fall and fire pits or how to pair bourbon with Thanksgiving. Well, I'll tell you what, Forrest, I'll take on both. Thank you for that great suggestion. Basically, I do think that these toasted bourbons, especially like Michter's, is really, really delicious by a fire pit. Now, I just built a fire pit, so this is fresh in my head. And I love, I love, uh, you know, smelling the smoke of the fire and then tasting some of that, that sweeter oak note. That's for you, Kenny. Kenny loves the sweet oak note. So I love, I love tasting that sweet oak note up against some of those nice, smoky uh, aromas coming from the dried wood or the kiln wood. It is a really nice treat to be able to do that. Now, what bourbons uh, would you pair for, with Thanksgiving? So Thanksgiving really is a, it is typically a white wine type of holiday. You're looking at a turkey. And these turkeys, like for no matter whether you deep fry it or you cook it in the oven or you have it really spicy, it's a very like delicate kind of flavor. And if you have something that's too big, you're going to knock out the flavor of the turkey, which I love a good turkey, especially fresh out of the oven or fresh out of the fryer when it's that skin's nice and crispy and the inside's still really hot. It's after turkey's been sitting around for a little bit that I, re I really don't. I don't like leftover turkey. I like the fresh, out of the oven, ready to eat right then and there turkey. So I think what you want here for what you, if you're going to pair a bourbon with the turkey, I really do think you need to go with something um, that is, that's got some, it's got some flavor, but I think if you go too high on proof, you're going to knock it out. So my suggestion is going to be Four Roses Yellow Label. I think that spiciness, um, while at 80 proof, is you know it's going to be really the lightness of it is is about where you want it, but that spiciness of it will complement you know some of that crispy skin, if you will. So my pick this year for a turkey pairing is Four Roses Yellow Label Neat. If you want to shake things up a little bit, make a cocktail. I think an old-fashioned would go great with this year's turkey. That's going to do it for this week's Above the Char. Thank you so much for always listening to Bourbon Pursuit. As we come up on Thanksgiving, I am thankful for you all and everything that you do for this podcast. You make, you make everything worth it for Kenny, Lauren, Ryan, and me. I am so thankful for you all. Take a picture of those birds as you're cooking them and tag Bourbon Pursuit and me, Fred Minnick, and uh, we'll comment on them. But that's going to do it. Cheers. Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. And Kenny here today talking about a topic that, and, and honestly, one of the guests that I'm super excited for because I fell in love with barrel-aged beers shortly after I fell in love with bourbon. And 
I think it was actually I can I can pinpoint it. I can actually pinpoint the day of when I found out about Goose Island Bourbon County style, Bourbon County brand style. We'll make sure we say the whole thing here. And it was in 2014. I was at a liquor barn in here in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was it was right before uh, Black Friday was coming around and stuff like that. And I was just looking for something good to kind of take home and have. And one of the people that worked there said, oh, you should come by tomorrow morning. There's always this release that happens on Black Friday every year. And these there's really awesome beers. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. Like, I'll come by. Like, what time do you think I should come? He's like, you should get here like as soon as it opens. I'm like, all right, it seems pretty aggressive for beer, but you know, whatever, let's I'll go find out. So I get there and I probably go like 20 or 30 minutes after it opens. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, really into it at the time. So I go and I pick myself up uh, a four pack of just the, the BCBS. And I think I also was, it was another year that the coffee was there and I picked up a bottle or two of that. And that's when my whole world changed. And I found out about, I mean, I just fell in love with, with Goose Island and the, the Bourbon County Stouts because I look at it as one of the pinnacle achievements of like, this is the bar that's set when it comes to creating some of the best barrel aged beers that's out there. And so I am super excited to be able to bring on our guest today because today we have Bill Savage. He is the lead brewer at the barrel program at Goose Island Beer Company. So Bill, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Very yeah, much absolutely. appreciated. Yeah, and, and oddly enough, I'd love to have you on here too because you know, you'd know you mentioned that you know, you've know you listened to the show as well. So even better when we have somebody that, you know it's, it's going to be vice versa. It's just going to be a lot of love going on here. Yeah, absolutely. It was really cool. Just like, I think I started listening to you guys probably two and a half, maybe three years ago. <laughs> Uh, which is crazy to think about now, but, uh, yeah, just kind of really been a big fan of just what you guys are doing for educating everybody and just, you know, having lighthearted, like honest discussions with people, uh, especially in, you know, this industry, um, just the spirits and drinks industry in general is people are just so genuine and like have a lot of love for what they do day in, day out. And it's just nice to have somebody that like shines a light on it, you know? I mean, I, I remember the day that you originally emailed us and I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, we got to get this guy on our show. Like, this is crazy because, like I said, I've been a huge fan of, of your all's products and everything like that for a while. And, you know, before I keep like piling on the compliments here, one thing that we've started doing a little bit differently is we've now started opening the show with kind of like a random icebreaker. And so I'm going to throw a question your way just so people get an idea of, of kind of a little bit more about you. So uh, your question is, how old is the oldest pair of shoes in your closet? Ooh. <laughs> uh, man, probably my soccer shoes. So they've got to be 12 years old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cleats or indoors? Cleats. Yeah? Yeah. Did, did you play a lot of competitive growing up or anything like that? Uh, played for high school. Um yeah, played high school pretty much all four years and then gave it up once I went to college, but uh, still played pickup and stuff here and there. So holding on to them just in case that pickup game you comes know, along. Now that I've got kids, I'm like, ah, one of them will fit into them, right? They'll still, yeah. they'll still work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I actually, you know, now that you say it, like I, I almost would have been there with you because I actually had to go buy a new pair. Uh, of cleats this year because my daughter wanted to pick it up. I played select growing up, played in high school and stuff like that. And so my daughter wanted to start playing. So I go to my basement and yeah, I grab my Adidas duffel bag that, you know, we all used to have and it's got all the patches that you used to go and trade patches yeah. with all the other teams and stuff like that. Like still, still on there. Awesome. Uh, all my referee gear in there. And then I go and I grab my cleats and like, there's, there's, you know, they're old Adidas oh, shoes, like, oh, they're fall. Yeah. I mean, like the leather, like you could almost like stick your finger through it. And then I like tried to bend the cleat in half and the plastic yeah. on the bottom just snapped. Yeah, it snapped. And I was That's like, great. well, yeah, so I guess, uh, I guess I got to go get a new pair now, which works out pretty well. The technology and everything has changed so much over a decade. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's honestly, it's funny because you go and you start reading stuff. You're like, oh, shit, people are still buying Sambas. Like, that's still like the the epitome of like indoor soccer still. Yeah. 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 Indoor was 
I mean, that's a different sport almost, but uh, yeah, it's great. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. See, we got something in common there, too. So that's awesome. Yeah. So how long have you been with Goose Island? Oh, man. Um, I guess I would say a medium amount of time. I've been uh, basically I started in the fall of 2013. So like right towards the tail end of BCS release of 2013. Because I remember my first day actually on the job. What I, I was working in the cellar at the time. And uh, we that was the year of um, the famous coconut uh, proprietors. And I was just cleaning filters out of coconut chunks that we're getting caught in our lines and valves and stuff. And that was, that was day one, just like stop the centrifuge, go do this, break this apart, sanitize everything again, rehook it up. And I think we did it at least 50 times minimum. Uh, And I think the yield that year was something close to like 50%. So not a whole lot. Yeah. It was so bad. (laughs) All that, uh, all that work. And you're just like, Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, people loved it. So it was kind of one of those, like, kind of a great way to introduce myself into that whole process and mindset of just like, it's all worth it. Just put your heart and elbow grease into it and it'll, it'll pay off. And so I guess before then, I guess kind of tell everybody about your, your journey into beer. Like what got you into this? You know, were you brewing in college and homebrew and you're like, Hey, I'm going to make a career out of this. Like, what was that? What was that tipping point that you said, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and make this my career. Yeah. It's, um, a little weird. I think I've talked to a bunch of other brewers who are like, yeah, same boat. Um, but for everybody else, it's kind of, it's going to seem like a bit of a leap. Um, so college, I was working like summers for a local park district that I grew up in and uh, I was working maintenance staff. So just doing like park cleanups, clean up other people's dogs stuff and (laughs) things. Oh yeah. man, I I, I guess I could open the show talking about like, what's the worst job you ever had? And you could have just nailed that one down. Oh yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, there were really fun parts of the job too, but uh, you know, those things stick out, I think. <laughs> um, but I was working there and, uh, one of the guys, uh, who was, I guess my supervisor, but I became really good friends with, he was a home brewer, avid home brewer. Uh, he had been doing it for like 10 years. So I just kind of went over to him and his buddies brew day and just kind of like sat, watched, learned, uh, was just fascinated by the whole thing. And then, uh, just you know, took a sip of some of the homebrew that they had made previously. And it was like a, I think it was a dogfish head clone of like 90 minute IPA or something. And it was just like totally, you know, just way outside my realm of what I've ever had before. So we started doing some homebrewing and I was just like, well, you guys are veterans at this, like at this point, like 10 years of just kind of churning and burning beers, uh, you know, what am I really contributing here? And so I actually got into uh, mead making and wine making separate just to kind of do something that's like a little different than these guys, something I'm not going to get judged way too harshly on just doing my first batch of homebrew beer, you know, they're going to rip me to shreds and they're no holds bar. So they always tell me when I'm doing a good or bad job, even now. So, uh, <laughs> be honest. oh yeah. And uh, so started doing that. And then, uh, I started working, uh, so graduated college in a major that there is no real work unless you go on to grad school, which I thought at the time I would do. But anyway, that's a separate story for a different time. But you uh, major in Sanskrit or something. Is that what it was? Uh, sort of. I, yeah. So, uh, classical literature and, uh, so Greek and Latin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So real useful. <laughs> it's all right. I think beer is pretty uh, useful too. So I think it turned out all right. Hey, you know, they were doing it back then too, right? So there's a True. connection. But yeah, so um, just kind of started chatting with those guys, keeping up on them, trying to learn uh, some recipe creation, like style points for them. 
And then, uh, so a homebrew shop and winery uh, that was the only one in Illinois, I think at the time or anywhere near Chicago was looking to hire somebody to just be an assistant. So I like dove headfirst into that. It was called Wild Blossom Meads. Uh, They're still around and I think still tasting pretty good. It's been a little while since I've had some of their stuff, but was working with them, just kind of doing a bit of everything, like from sales, runs, uh, self-distribution, a lot of packaging days, um, but any cleaning and like basically tweaking, just kind of like checking for different types of acid profiles, you know, testing gravities, things like that, doing back sweetening if need be, uh, and yeast pitches. I kind of got a hand in all of that. Um, they also did some house wine making for some of the hotels in Chicago. So I got to dabble a bit in, you know, not really like sommelier work, but I kind of got a little bit of a taste for just like what goes into uh, wines and, and meads. And doing a little bit of beekeeping at the same time. So I just kind of dabbled in a bit of everything. And I've never really been, uh, you know, perfect at any one thing. I just like kind of dabbling in a bit of everything. So it was kind of a good fit. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. And and so (laughs) let's let's go ahead and let's move to the point where so you, you know, you're kind of getting... You've got a little bit of the inside, like you're you're starting to brew your own beer. You kind of know this sort of stuff. So, what's the the jump to Goose Island? And when you get to Goose Island, sure. when you get to Goose Island, like what what's it take to get there and like be in the the barrel program? Yeah. So from uh, making wines and meads, I kind of bounced to uh, another local brew pub. So I worked there for a couple years, uh, and then from there, I got into like my foot in the door, I met the brewmaster at the time of Goose Island. We, we crossed paths at GABF uh, in 2013. So uh, we just kind of hit it off and they were, they just mentioned that they were looking for, uh, you know, other brewers coming up here soon. So I applied like right away and just sat down there like, okay, when can you start? <laughs> so <laughs> I was just like, oh, cool. All right, let's get going. So basically, I just started working in the cellar, just kind of uh, normal transfers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, nothing, you know, super sexy or anything, just kind of uh, running day to day transfers, clarification, yeast pitches, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I was working there. I, I did about two years, maybe a little more in the cellar. And then I spent a year in the brew house and uh, in that year, uh, while I was doing kind of hot side work, the position opened up for the uh, barrel program lead. And we were making quite a few transitions at that point. It was also kind of an awkward time because that was right when or right after we were starting to deal with uh, a bunch of the issues that we had from the 2015 batch. So we had, I think there's a different word for it, but essentially a recall on uh, 2015 Bourbon County brand stout that was of certain, you know, date codes because we found an infection or a, a bacteria contamination. So it wasn't harmful or anything like that, but it definitely altered the flavor substantially from what we normally see and, and shoot for, uh, for both barley wine and original. Without looking back at it, I'm not sure if there were any others, but I'm sure listeners will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Better go to a beer form because they're all right, over it. Right. Yeah. So apologies if I left anything out. But um, basically, we were kind of in the throes of just backtracing everything. Um, they were pretty, pretty clear and just kind of saying like, hey, this is a mess. You want to help out? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, sure. Okay, let's do this. Let's dive in. And, you know, we definitely had a lot of help. Um, Brooke, who's our now our quality control manager, uh, helped out a ton. We had a lot of volunteers. I mean, it's a big deal, um, you know, especially because we have such kind of a, I don't want to say a cult following, but we have such a big following. It makes it tough because, you know, we, we value the consumer very, very much. Um, it might not I don't know if it always seems like it because we have grown so much and, you know, it can seem kind of more like there's no face to 
Goose Island, but hopefully if anybody actually reaches out to us, we definitely do try to, you know, let people know what's happening. Uh, you know, if there are any issues, we do try to handle it in an appropriate manner. Yeah. Well, I don't want to dive that into kind of issues, thing, you know, much. but like, I, I want to dive into the good stuff. That's, <laughs> sure. that's what I want to do. Like, well, so, so, but that was like when I started. So yeah, it was just kind of like, okay, I'll throw you to the wolves. Uh, absolutely. And it was like a really great challenge, but, um, I think we made the right calls and everything, but you know, hindsight's a little different. We're a couple of years out from that now. And, uh, yeah, things are feeling good. Things are feeling much more kind of back to normal. If there is a normal, uh, we're always <laughs> trying something different and always kind of pushing ourselves, um, to a degree, but also having just kind of high standards for what we release. Um, so what we try isn't always what gets out there, but yeah, well, I want to, I want to talk about that one a little bit, right? I, sure. I kind of want to, I kind of want to bring it back, uh, just a bit because, you know, you'd mentioned the cult following and there truly is. I mean, there's every single year it's Black Friday. People are lined up every single liquor store almost across the nation. Depends on your distribution and where it gets. But I mean, there's always people that are out there. And so it's it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger every single year. But I kind of want to roll back to talk about kind of like a little bit of the science, a little bit of like, like what goes on that we don't see. So you know, you get a barrel, um, just, you know, you get bourbon barrels freshly dumped. You're probably getting them from all different kinds of, uh, distilleries kind of talk about the, the quality control process that just goes into a particular barrel. And if it's going to, uh, kind of cut the mustard to, to grow up and be a BCBS. Sure. Yeah. So our quality parameters are, I don't want to say super strict, but we do have kind of our set. Um, so we kind of only go through a handful of fairly well-known, uh, you know, d distilleries. We'll take, um, anything. The biggest thing for us that we kind of look for, for early cuts or things that we don't accept are anything that's kind of, we know has been holding some water. So every, every distillery does typically does a flush, um, of like, three to five gallons um, after they've dumped, it's like on their line. I go and qualify places, essentially. Um, we still work with a broker, but uh, they've hooked us up with getting into contact with dump line managers and just kind of going through the process of like, okay, what brands do you do that, you know, maybe get a little extra or don't? Um, how do you isolate those, um, those kinds of things? And typically, uh, anything that just gets like a quick rinse uh, and then sealed back up, we will happily take. I do look for a couple other things. So um, the actual cooperage, the original cooperage, uh, you can tell a few things from that. So there's some stuff that I'm not as big of a fan of. We might try for a specialty batch here and there, but typically we don't just accept for basically just wood quality. I'll break it down to just that. Um, some people use kind of whatever they can get, still do a decent like four year bourbon out of it. And that's fine for the distillery. But, you know, once it's past that point and comes down to us, even just the shipping can damage it pretty heavily. And so I try to weed some of those out. But typically we're looking for mostly like four plus year bourbons uh, that just kind of helps take most of the kind of harsher alcohols out from the get go. So you're not going to get that throat burn since beer is quite a bit different than distillate it's just kind of more of a balancing act from what we do uh it's a little bit easier to kind of get some of those harsher characteristics in a beer than uh you can just you can't just blend it away like you can at a distillery per se um so that's kind of one thing that we definitely have um that kind of age statement more or less i got you so you're and most of these i'm assuming are like char level four probably coming from like independent state because that's that's a big one it's big uh yeah uh and then i guess also kind of talk about the scale of this because i've done a, a barrel aged beer collaboration we did it with two barrels mm -hmm. but i know what you all are doing this is i mean this is what would be even more sizable than probably like a a, a booker's dump so kind of talk about how many barrels are going into like a yearly release of of bourbon county stout uh, well, you asked me a question I can't technically answer, oh, okay. uh, but 
Uh, I'm, I can't here to, I'm here to poke it, and prod a little bit. Yeah, that's <laughs> for sure. Uh, so typically we're looking at, I mean, per year it's, it's, it's a few thousand. Yeah. I mean, it's, I figured it's, it's going to be quite sizable uh, going into it. It's enough for us to keep busy for at least four months of the year uh, doing nothing but so. Yeah. And, day in, and, day out. And for sure, you know, and with the cult following, I would imagine that this is almost like one of Goose Island's like, it, there's a lot of probably pressure, a lot of stuff on the radar for you all. Like, like this is like, it's got to, you got to nail it every single year. Um, you can't, you literally, you cannot have a bad year. Like it, it would just be no good for you. So kind of talk about, you know, what do you, what process do you go through? Because I'm sure, I'm even sure there's other things that you can't tell about how long you age it in the barrel as well. Uh, or can you? I, I can be honest about that one. Yeah. We have a minimum spec, uh, coming out. So we're for original, like the, the balance has to be a minimum of eight months to a year for like the total blend. So, um, we typically are almost never younger than eight months and we go, we've gone pretty long. Uh, so we've aged some of our el older stock closer to like year and a half. So for, for beer, that's quite a long time. Um, we've done a couple like specialty release things that have been two year or two year plus. Um, but that's really pretty rare. And that's usually closer to the ballpark of like, you know, 50 barrels or 50. We always say casks. So if I ever like start diverting and say casks in terms of volume, uh, it's because beer barrels is a different metric. It's a different, uh, quantity. So Makes sense. Yeah. In, in my world, yeah, it's always cask number and then volume is totally different. So, Yeah. And so I guess one, one of the questions that that was kind of like trailing on with that is like, what is your quality control process that you're going through? Because everybody knows that at some point, like it could go bad because beer is all about bacteria. And if at some point you're filling up that beer barrel and there's some sort of rogue bacteria that either gets in or is in the barrel, uh, you don't want that to then spread and ruin the entire batch. So are you all testing each barrel? Are you doing it multiple times per year? Kind of talk about that as well. Let's talk about ice balls versus ice cubes. It's all about physics, and volume, and surface area. Did you know that an ice ball has 24% less surface area compared to the same volume of ice in a cube form? Well, less surface area exposed to warm liquid means a slower ice melt and less drink dilution without sacrificing any chilling power. And the coolest way to make ice balls is with a meltdown ice ball press. First, you take some ice and the provided silicone cups. You place this ice into meltdown and watch as the conduction from copper or aluminum melts the ice right in front of you. You can literally see the melted water cascade down the sides. And in a minute, you've got a perfect ice ball to put in your drink. Meltdown, it's the perfect solution to dilution pollution. You can use promo code PURSUIT to receive $100 off. So check it out now at MeltdownIce.com. Age de Noor is a small brand founded by two bourbon-loving brother-in-laws who design innovative products for whiskey lovers. And their products have been featured by the likes of Food & Wine and GQ Magazine. The travel decanter is the best way to travel and bring your favorite spirits wherever you go. Visit agedandor.com to see their entire collection of products and stay up to date on upcoming launches this bourbon season. Are you a private barrel club looking for total control over your own label? Or perhaps a retailer wanting low minimums on a private label bourbon that sells? Or maybe you're just a business, an organization, or charity, and you're looking to make a statement with your own gift of a barrel pick. Indiana's own Krogman's makes it super easy. Make the pilgrimage to Bloomington, Indiana, where tucked away in the old Otis Elevator Factory, you can select your own barrel or barrels and discuss every detail of your bottle, from the label, the cap, and the closure, and create something truly unique. So stop putting stickers on picks and take your club to the next level. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S dot com to learn more. Are you all testing each barrel? Are you doing it multiple times per year? Kind of talk about that as well. Sure. Yeah. So we, we do a couple things. So, uh, beer is a lot closer to wine in that, 
you know, in the spirits world, you know, you're going off a of, like once you have your distillate and you're adding it to the cask, like there's no bacteria that'll survive that environment and that in that liquid. So wine and beer are different in that there are quite a few microbes that'll you know definitely survive at even higher alcohol levels uh, up to like twenty percent or more. For us, the big that's why we always want the freshest dumped barrels we can get. Uh, and timing that for like a minimum amount of time that it can even sit in our warehouse before we use those. Uh, we have basically a four week window is what we do. Um, I'm sure other people do less, but that's, you know, with the amount that we do and how frequently we're brewing and things can change on your schedule, uh, without you knowing pretty quickly. Uh, that's just kind of our standard. We do, We've kind of switched up a couple times, um, but typically we're doing at least 200 day checks. That gives us a good idea of anything that can be growing in the beer uh, after we've filled. You know, we'll be able to determine what quantity, uh, if it's having an actual effect on the palate. And it also will have grown enough so that when we pull samples for our micro lab uh, and we're uh, plating them, we do an enrichment that basically lets us know pretty quick if there's anything major going wrong. Um, yeah, it's probably a good thing to know. Yeah, early so, on. So that, and we also do kind of random selection um, PCR, um, which is basically a rapid rapid growth media um, for about. I want to say it's. I'm going to say this wrong. Brooke will correct me, but it'll be. Uh, I think 10 days and then run it through basically a DNA sequencer. So it'll tell us essentially whether or not there are any harmful bacteria that even were alive because in the process, it basically scrambles the DNA and puts it back together so that you can see what type of bacteria there was at some point that could have been in the fermenter. It could have been in the tank tanker because we do tanker runs between my warehouse and the actual brewery. So it could have been that, it could have been in their transfer lines theoretically. So there's a lot of areas that doesn't really tell you where your issue maybe could have been, but it helps us kind of determine, you know, what happened when. Um, so we pull a couple samples basically at different stages all along the way. And, and we just do detective work after that. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like it's a, that's another full-time job of just trying to figure out, making sure that because I mean, it's got to be tough knowing that anything that you're putting into a barrel today, you're not going to be able to release it for a year. And right. so you've got 365 days that, yeah, something yeah. could go wrong. And right. I'm assuming there's also like the notion that you can overage. A, can you overage a beer in a barrel as well? Like if you left it there like two years, you talked about some experience two years, but like three, four, five, like does anybody actually do that? Or is like, that's just, that's just bonkers to do something like that. It's a balancing act, right? For us, I, I think for anyone in kind of craft uh, beer, spirits, or wine making, like the end product speaks for itself. So if if you're going to try something, that's a lot of time. Uh, if you're paying rent on a location, you're paying, you know what I mean? Like all that adds up. Um, and I know especially for smaller folks, it can be uh, just cost prohibitory, right? Um, and for us... We've done up to two. We don't really like it up much past like two and a half. Uh, you're just going to start getting more. And it could be like beer dependent. So different types of beers kind of age faster, can age longer than others. But um, typically for us, yeah, two and a half is like the max uh, that we've been okay with. And everybody's palate's a little different around the office. So even uh, amongst ourselves, we argue and bicker. But uh you know, pulling too much tannin or just having too much of that, you know, prune juice kind of characteristic or just oxidative characteristics in general are usually just not, it, unless it's balanced, um, you know, balance is key for us. So that's kind of why we dabble in different, you know, stock ages, essentially. Um, and that's largely what I do is kind of determine what those groups are going to be and how it's going to play out year after year well next time i'm in chicago i want to come and see what this prune juice is all about because i know when when i introduce people to it i'll be like they'll be like what's it taste like i'm like if you could mix like soy sauce together like it's like it's Chocolate like that cake and soy <laughs> sauce and like, like that 
you know, it's got the texture of motor oil. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you love this? I'm like, you're going to love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the alcohol doesn't hurt, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's just such a monstrosity of like what people would normally think is beer, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure. And, and I want to talk about the alcohol here in a second, but there's another question I want to ask about the barrels real quick, because, you know, with, with bourbon barrels, it's a, it's a used once and it's done sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Are you all ever reusing things or is it like once we use it for our batch, uh, it's off to make furniture or something like what's, what's your all's process? Sure. Yeah. So we've changed it, um, since I started several times, <laughs> but, um, the big thing we do is we kind of stick to that one and done mentality by and large. Um, the only time now, uh, that we'll do anything with it is if we're going to do some sort of sour beer, you know, trial batches or use it in, uh, like we've done, um, Oh, what did we, what did we call it? Fooder red was a good example. It's essentially a Flanders red style, um, sour beer that, uh, aged in both fooders. And then we used some used BCS to kind of get a little bit more like kind of chocolatey notes and, uh, a little bit more depth to it, but only if it's going to like sour production, we used to do barley wine used to be a blend of both fresh and used, uh, bourbon County barrels. Um, and to be honest, I really liked that blend, but it, obviously it, it just lends itself a little bit too easily for, uh, issues down the road so we just avoid it now like the like, like bacteria like, yeah. and contamination and exactly, yeah. yeah so it's i mean part of the problem really is not so much um like if it was just the beer itself i think things would be fine um but that particular beer just has so much uh fermentable sugar still in it so even wild yeast contaminations are a potential issue or refermentation with our house strain. So like we could have theoretically uh, exploding barrels, right? Because it'll build up enough pressure that it'll just do that. Yeah. It sounds like a problem. It could be. Um, but that's also the flavor profile that we, you know, you want some of that kind of candy sweetness on that beer because it's got more hops in it. Um, number one. So it's got a little bit more bite. Um, and we usually like to use, uh, yeah, just some of the bourbons that we've used <laughs> on it uh, tend to be a little hotter. So you you just kind of, again, it's your palate. So you want to do that balancing act kind of thing. And that's just where that recipe kind of is. Um, and that's how most people like that style. So uh, we think we make a decent one. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's just kind of part of that dance. It's, it's a, all a balancing act from the workload uh, to the palate. And I'm actually a big fan of the barley wine as well. It's it's actually one of my favorite variants every single year. Uh, and I'll, we'll talk about variants in a little bit, but you know, you'd mentioned also the alcohol. And I think this is something that I talk to people and, and maybe it's what ruined me with barrel aged beers and just stouts in general. It was like, eh, if it's not over 12%, I really don't, I'm not, I don't even feel like drinking it. And so every, I've got a few of them here. So, I mean, I've got, uh, this BCBS and it's 14.3. Um, I've got a coffee variant from 2017. This one's 12.9. Uh, I think I have, this one was from a year or two ago. It was this, uh, collaboration with Elijah Craig yeah. came in these fancy boxes It also has the fancy label. Uh, this one was 15.2. And I also have this other one. This is like the creme de la creme for me. And I uh, will talk about it here in a minute. And this was the, the 2015 uh, what reserve. I forget what it was called. This I think one. that's rare. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the rare one. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I'll also say, I think this was like, it was like 40 or $60 like SRP. I can't remember what it was, but I, I told myself, I, I got one. Um, because this one was aged two years in 35 year old heaven hill barrels yeah and i'm i should probably drink it soon because i know these things have a have a shelf life please but do. i t- but i t- but i told myself i was like man if i like this i'm really gonna kick myself in the ass for like only wanting to drink like 50 dollar beers so <laughs> yeah so there's there's a problem there but i kind of want to know like the thoughts behind creating something that is uh you know pretty much everything is seems like it's over 12 percent. sometimes reaching up to 15 16 percent. so talk about the rationale behind really packing you know a good amount of alcohol into these stouts 
Yeah. So, I mean, part of it is, again, it's like, it's like winemaking. You're going to be picking up a lot of like oak tannins. You're going to be picking up the heat from the bourbon, which can come across as sweet at certain times or at certain levels. Um, but if you don't have kind of a robust beer to begin with, it's, it's just going to taste kind of weird. And, you know, the reason we have kind of such a, that oil mouthfeel, that like thick, viscous uh, character is really so that it can kind of play with those characteristics from the bourbon um, or from whatever spirit barrel we end up kind of using. So the alcohol content is a couple of things. It helps the base beer kind of stand out because you're also getting a lot of like ester production from our house yeast. So a lot of kind of fruitier notes are coming across, but you're also kind of able to have that side by side with some of the distillate, if that makes sense. So the way we kind of look at things is just, again, try to be kind of that, not middle of the road. I hate to say that because that's not <laughs> Definitely really not accurate, what this, right? This beer is not middle of the road at all. But it's it's just kind of trying to marry two totally different things, right? Um, but at the same time, still be able to pick out individual aspects of both. So that's kind of like our approach is kind of, paying homage to both the distilleries that we're working with and kind of working, not for, but absolutely working together on and uh, staying true to kind of just our vision of the beer, Greg Hall, who was our original brewmaster who came up with the recipe years and years ago, uh, trying to stay true to that. Yeah. And, And funny you say, like, try to stay true to that recipe. I know there's even, and we had mentioned earlier about clones, like there's BCBS clones out there, like there's tons of them. So anybody that's into home brewing, you know, you can do it and try to get yourself and, you know, go try to find a barrel and, you know, see what you get after a year. Yeah. I think that that's the fun part is you can just age a beer in your barrel in your garage for a year. And then after that, you've got a, you got a lot of beer to go. You got a lot to go through though. That's a lot. <laughs> It is. It is a lot of friends. Exactly. I mean, it's it's not a bad problem to have, but yes, it is a lot of beer to go through, and that's what I think that's been my problem too. Is that uh, uh, you know, last year I only went out and got like two or three bottles because I've got I think two cases of of Bourbon County Stout in the basement that I've been buying since like 2014. Like I said, that was the first four pack that I had, and after that, it just it became an addiction to try and, you know, taste them all, try the variants and, you know, getting to the variants is, is I think where people really, maybe I don't know if they get hung up on it, but it is definitely like where people are like, it's like, I got to collect them all. I got to get every single one. So kind of talk about first off, like the brainstorming, like what goes into saying, okay, like this is what we're going to plan out a year from now on these types of variants. I'm assuming that you all have done micro tests of these previously and said, okay, now we're going to try to do this on a large scale. Kind of, kind of talk about that process. Yeah. So that's actually a sort of true and not true at the same time. So we have a few things. Uh, our R and D manager, uh, Mike Siegel puts together a taste panel of sorts every year. And it's actually So we use original from the year prior as a base every year, but then we basically have all the brewers and really pretty much anyone in the company can be a part of this, but typically it's brewer led and everybody just kind of tries to come up with, they probably have ideas ahead of time. You know, they might be, have been working on this for three years prior, but sometimes it's just spur of the moment. And uh, we basically do some, like home editions, everybody brings their jar in. <laughs> Everything's kind of unlabeled. Like we ha- we have basic information. Like this, these are the ingredients that are in there. So if anybody's like allergic to something, you know, they're not going to get a a nasty surprise. But it sounds like a, like it would be like a company like Chili Cookoff, but yeah. they just got different beers, and everybody just has to Absolutely. go and try everything. Yeah. That's a hundred percent what it is, um, and that's how we determine what proprietors is going to be every year. So it's a really fun kind of way to showcase what, just what people are kind of, what sort of headspace they're in and what, what they really think is going to be like an interesting play. And usually we just kind of, we literally just go through notes and uh, we'll do like three different sessions. 
Uh, so someone can submit the same thing over and over again and like refine it or do something totally different every time. But we basically just have a lot of fun and try to figure out, you know, what's the most popular, why, what would be the easiest to scale up? Um, can we source ingredients that make some semblance of sense uh, and do it in a way that is not going to compromise the whole beer? You know what I mean? It's not going to cause any issues with, you know, micro contamination. Can we get uh, aseptic, whatever, um, yeah, you know, fruit or uh, something along those lines, or can we process it in a way that um, isn't going to be just a huge time suck for the brewery, um, depending on how good it is, I guess, because mm-hmm. if it's really good, then we'll just, we'll spend as much time as we have to, but uh, yeah. yeah. And you had mentioned, you had mentioned proprietors there. So for anybody that doesn't know, there is a variant every year and it's called prop or proprietors and it is only available in like the, the Chicago area, right? Something like that. Yeah, it's kind of just our, like our way of kind of saying like, thanks to Chicago for just kind of tagging along with us for so long and, and here's something a little special for our backyard. So yeah, no, that's awesome. So the other thing I do want to kind of talk about is, is some of these like special collaborations that you all have done. So like the one I'm holding right here, this was the 2018, uh, it was with Elijah Craig. This stout was aged in 12 year old barrels. And then I believe in 2019 was the Knob Creek uh, edition. So kind of talk about, you know, are you all reaching out to these distilleries and wanting to do these collaborations or is it, uh, it's like, Hey, if we do this, like they're going to give us the best barrels and we're going to create an awesome beer out of it. Let's kind of talk about the, uh, you know, the thought process behind there as well. Yeah. So it's actually, it's been a little bit of a mix. So, um, you know, we try to, just kind of keep a beat on what the distilleries are up to, uh, especially ones that we particularly like. And that's total personal preference. Um, that's pretty much it, but, uh, <laughs> it's just, it's whatever, whatever, it's very Bill, selfish. <laughs> yeah. Whatever Bill likes this week. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but we've worked a lot over the years with, uh, heaven Hill in particular. Um, and definitely, uh, Jim beam, they've been just really great partners. Um, I think Beam was the first, uh, those were the first barrels that BCS ever got aged in. So we have a bit of a rapport with those guys um, and gals, but the Heaven Hill has been a bit more of a more recent uh, trend for us. And um, really we just, yeah, we just like the juice. So (laughs) we we typically are just like, hey, anytime you guys have you know, our, our kind of palettes are typically in that, you know, I would say 10 year to 15, 16, um, bourbons. And those are kind of just our sweet spot. Uh, and that goes for just about everybody at, at the brewery. So, um, that at least makes, helps make these decisions. So most of the time the brewers are really the ones that get to make those decisions. So it's not like some, somebody from marketing is like, Hey, have you had this? Have you had this? And we'll just be like, you know, we're all about trying stuff. Um, we'll definitely like chat and try to seek some stuff out, but typically we're really just like, yeah, I'm just coming back to this. So, uh, this is what we want to do. So is the thought process behind, you know, that age of the barrel, is it because it's not the barrel in itself. It's probably because the whiskey that was in that barrel had been absorbed into the staves and and stuff like that. And therefore that is what's going to be, um, again, absorbed or like brought into the beer? Is that kind of the thinking? Yep, absolutely. So we're basically just kind of going off of, um, you know, what are the kind of flavor notes that we pick out? Um, Is that going to play well with Bourbon County when it's like just unaged? Uh, And once we determine that, we're pretty much just like, okay, let's age something in that if we can get our hands on it. And that's become more of an issue for sure. Uh, especially I'd say the last two years, it's been harder and harder to get certain casks, but yeah, I would imagine it's, it's the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, And so when we talk about the different variants, um, I know I want to kind of get off the stout train a little bit because, you know, we've talked about barley wine already. Um, I believe two years ago there was a wheat wine 
And so you are trying different things. And, and some people have asked, like, are there other ideas that you're, you all are exploring of doing things outside of stouts, um, such as ales or Belgian beers or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, so we've done a couple of barrel aged Sophie or something like that. (laughs) So we've done a number of different projects. We just, um, kind of our philosophy on it is a little bit different, um, than maybe a lot of other breweries and there's no, you know, right or wrong way. It's just our take is anything that's going to be called or have bourbon County brand associated with it has to be kind of a certain caliber and kind of tested, uh, to be frank. It, even if we did, uh, and had a really good release of, uh, we've done like a barrel age quad, for instance, we've done, uh, we used to have a Cooper series where we did kind of shorter term residency time, uh, beers that, you know, would still work okay or work well with barrel aging, but we didn't want to extend that time out. Um, we did a couple trials with it and it just doesn't turn out as well just because of the styles. So oxidation really takes over on lighter color beers in particular, uh, much faster. So even the wheat wine, I think you'll get a lot more kind of more just like syrupy notes. Um, that's how I p- perceive it. Um, it's, it's kind of more, you might get some, I don't want to say anything too rough around the edges, but you definitely get kind of more of like a sweeter note. And that's what that oxygen kind of does while that beer is aging. Um, And that kind of gets hidden more in some darker beers. So like, especially like quads, anything with uh, more caramel malts uh, added to the grain bill, you're going to get kind of some of those marrying attributes. So it's not as pronounced. But with wheat wine, there's literally no caramel malts at all. So it was really just a way for us to showcase what is happening in the barrel. And that's it. So that was kind of just a fun experiment that we did that we thought turned out really nicely. And we've done a couple releases now. So it was just kind of serendipitous. Um, Yeah, I I mean, by and large, we're trying a bunch of different things. Um, Not quite as much as maybe some other folks, but uh, I think it's partially because we have such a following for the stout that we just kind of, that's, that's primarily what we're brewing basically all year round in order to get the volume that we're kind of shooting for hopefully, uh, by the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, between you all, and I'd say probably my next favorite might be like Prairie, you know, they, they do a fantastic job with, with barrel aged beers as well. Um, but you know, would you all have, you all have a, a massive like basically people will put you on a radar and on a pedestal and it, it really is it's it's the gold standard of what barrel aged beers are, are really all about and especially barrel aged stouts and and i always look at this as anybody that is from the bourbon world and think that you don't like beers like you've got to try these because you do you get barrel influence and it really it shines through especially in some of these and and so i always i always tell people like just give it a try um if you don't like it just give the rest to me. I'll, I'll drink. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's exactly what I used to say. Uh, especially when I was like first going to bars more and now that I have kids that's and COVID, uh, but basically anything, um, people are just like, ah, I really don't like that. I'll be like, yeah, yeah just pass it over here. Over. I'll help it's, you out. It's okay. Yeah. 15%. Uh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Bill, you know, I want to say thank you so much for for coming on the show. I, I'm probably going to reach out to you again in the future when I have beer questions and stuff like that, because please do. Yeah. I mean, you, you definitely shined a lot of light on not only just, you know, the products and everything like that. And everybody that is, it doesn't know by now, get, get prepared for Black Friday, right? That is the day after Thanksgiving, when all these beers go on sale across the nation and you'll be able to see you know, press releases coming out of the variants and everything like that. Um, so you'll make sure that you have to, uh, go and go on the hunt. So people that are used to hunting for bourbon, now you gotta, you gotta fight the beer people and it's, it's a, it's a whole different breed of people. So it's we like uh, sharing, you know, yeah, Hopefully it's not too scary, but, uh, yeah, we, we love to share. So yeah, if you guys want to check out this year, hopefully we can send you guys a couple samples and, uh, get your take on it. I, I would love to kind of have more round table discussion with people who really have a palate for bourbon too. Uh, that's something that we, I mean, Chicago has quite a 
bourbon culture, but, um, you know, just getting people who really love both aspects, you know, giving feedback can help us too, right? Like we're always in the pursuit of improvement. So whatever you guys got. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Count me in, man. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna have to make a trip to Chicago soon and, and go see this thing in full scale too. So uh, again, Bill, I want to say thank you again for, for coming on the show today. Um, if there's any way that people want to know more about you, uh, follow you on any social or find more about, uh, you know, Bourbon County style, how would they do that? So, uh, Goose Island has an Instagram account and, uh, Facebook and all that. Uh, I am very hard to reach. Um, <laughs> I have my yeah, so work he had email. to reach out to me. Uh, he had to reach out to right. me. That's how this all got started. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't go on social at all. <laughs> I think I have a Facebook account, but I haven't checked it in probably three years. Uh, so good luck. Um, you, but yeah. you have your questions, send it to me, and then I'll yeah. send them to Bill. <laughs> I'll yeah, be your filter. Just, you know, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so there you go. Well, I, I can tell you right now, you can follow Goose Island on all the socials. They're everywhere. And I, I know during um, you know, Thanksgiving time of the year, you're going to see a lot of stuff coming out, uh, for, for bourbon County stout. So make sure you go and check that out and make sure you follow us on all the socials. And if you like what you hear, leave us a review on iTunes or actually it's called Apple podcast. Now what am I talking about? But anywhere you get your podcast, leave us a review. And if you like the show and want to support us, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. So with that, Bill, thank you again for joining the show. Cheers everybody. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>